Okay, um, thank you, Alex. Appreciate that. So um, we'll take a journey through the Lake Forest of the 1920s today. Um, 1920s, also known as the Jazz Age, sort of thought of as between the time between World War I and the crash of the stock market in 1929. And so uh, not only did that decade see the rise of dance marathons, radio shows, and jazz, but it was certainly also a decade of great economic and social transformation. And Lake Forest was no different. Um, for the first time in the year 1920, more Americans lived in cities than on farms. Uh, between 1920 and 1929, the nation's total wealth doubled, more than doubled. And um, this economic growth swept many Americans into um, an affluent but unfamiliar consumer society. Um, thanks to nationwide advertising and the spread of chain stores, people from coast to coast could buy the same goods. Uh, radio and film helped spread the new youth culture with its music, dances, and slang across the country. Uh, the 1920s were also a pivotal decade in the history of Lake Forest. Um, in 1920, uh, according to the census, the population was about 3,600, which was really only about 300 more people than 10 years earlier. But um, the decade brought many changes to the small community. Um, the size of the city um, was about to change dramatically. Uh, the population nearly doubled to 6,500 people in 1930 and um, the land area tripled. So by the end of the 1920s, um, the community that um, we know today really began to take shape. So uh, over the previous decades, Lake Forest had developed, developed a reputation uh, both around Chicago and nationally as one of the most affluent enclaves in the Midwest. Um, but it was also home to a significant working class population uh, many immigrants or children of immigrants, and uh, these people worked in trades, they ran local businesses, or worked as service staff on some of the area residences and estates. Like most communities on the North Shore, in 1920, Lake Forest was by vast majority a white community. Um, an analysis of the 1920 census finds uh, about 134 people of color living in the city limits, which is about 3.7 percent. Um, nearly all of these were black with one Japanese family. And so generally those black families lived in one of three neighborhoods in town, um, in the north on Granby Road or Noble Avenue, in the south on Washington Circle or on Illinois, and in the west on Illinois Road in Bank Lane. Um, a few uh, people of color also lived um, uh, in residence on the estates, um, which was a common employer. Um, Many black residents had jobs as chauffeurs, gardeners, or domestics. Uh, the classified ads in the Lake Forester from the time laid bare some of the realities about seeking employment in the 1920s as a person of color. So you can see it left there, a chauffeur seeking a position makes his racial background clear in the advertisement. Um, no doubt due to the prevalence of employers such as the ad on the right, which, who limited their search to white applicants only. Um, other people of color in the community, like Meeks Johnson, who's um, at Lake Forester advertisement you can see there, uh, may have been self-employed in trades like um, garbage collecting, like Mr. Johnson was. So in the 1920s, Lake Forest was reorienting itself geographically in a couple ways. Um, first, from a town focused sort of more on the east side on the churches and schools to one with an architecturally remade city center. So back in 1916, uh, the business district had been radically transformed by a group of local investors who wanted to remake the downtown in sort of the spirit of the uh, City Beautiful movement. And so you can see the top image is before and the lower one is after. Um, and Howard Van Doren Shaw created Market Square, uh, which, was, uh, which is seen as the first planned shopping center in the nation. And it's certainly the first shopping center in the US to incorporate sort of the newfound parking and loading needs of automobiles. So the goal in redesigning the downtown was um, to create a business district that was worthy of a community full of architectural masterpieces. It wasn't really to attract new retailers. Uh, many of the same local shopkeepers moved into the shopping center. Uh, though some, including one or two black owned businesses were forced to relocate after the, the new buildings went up. 
but by the 1920s, the mix of shops in Market Square started to change a little bit. Um, uh, the local socialite turned entrepreneur, Margaret Baxter Foster, opened the sports shop in Market Square in 1922. She sold sportswear separates, which at the time were sort of a totally new figure-freeing mode of dressing, all, all the rage at the time in Paris and New York. And it was now at the fingertips of Lake Forest women as well. Of course, this is now the Lake Forest shop. Uh, also in the 1920s, regional chain stores were arising across the country, and even Market Square saw uh, the manifestation of this trend. So in 1922, um, National Tea Company, which at the time was a, a Midwestern grocery chain that had about 600 stores in the Chicago area alone, um, opened a branch in Market Square. So you can see their ad there, the left. Um, the company's founder, George Rasmussen, had an estate in Lake Forest on Old Mill Road. Then uh, later in 1928, um, the beloved Chicago department store, which you already mentioned tonight, uh, Marshall Field and Company opened its first suburban branch in Lake Forest. Um, at first, Marshall Field just sold uh, children's clothes in a storefront on Deer Path, but uh, by 1931, they moved to the Market Square Anchor Store. Um, and expanded to ladies' apparel as well. Um, in uh, the year 1920, the Lake Forester featured the advertisement there on the left from the men's clothing store run by Mayor Kubelski, which was located on the north side of Market Square. Um, the ad announces a 20% off sale as, um, quote, a uh, knock to the old HCL, which stands for high cost of living. Um, although the 1920s have a reputation as being the Roaring Twenties, actually the early part of the decade was not really so booming. Uh, by the summer of 1920, prices and living costs in the U.S. had reached sort of unprecedented levels as the demand for U.S. goods in Europe continued alongside the shift from wartime to peacetime production. So this led to sort of a sharp deflationary recession in 1920 and 21. Um, which brought on financial struggles in businesses both small and large. Um, so not only Mayor Kubelski, but this was also the period that the local Armour family lost their majority interest in their meatpacking business, um, which they would regain a decade later. But back to Mayor Kubelski, um, he was a Russian immigrant who came to Lake Forest from Waukegan in 1918. You can see him pictured circled in red there. Um, after his Waukegan store went bankrupt, he forged a new start um, by drawing on previously untouched funds sent by his son Benjamin, who is better known as Jack Benny. Uh, Benny was then an up-and-coming vaudeville performer, but he was on his way to becoming a top comedian, actor, and national figure. Um, he often visited his father and sister in Lake Forest and would occasionally sign autographs at the, um, the tailor shop. His father ran from uh, 1918 to 26. So uh, historians estimate that by the end of the 1920s, at fully three quarters of the American population was visiting a movie theater every week. Um, it's hard to imagine, particularly right now. Uh, locally, movies were shown um, at the time at the Deluxe Theater, which was at West Westminster and Bank Lane. Um, Joseph O'Neill had opened this, uh, the first motion picture house in Lake Forest um, back in 1912, and it was next to the location of the hardware store, as you can see from uh, the map there. Um, so after he opened it, the Lake Forest City Council spent the next six years uh, regulating this newfangled operation, um, largely focusing on whether or not to let the theater show movies on Sundays. At first, the answer was no. And then after all the surrounding towns allowed it, they changed it to yes. Um, by 1917, O'Neill turned over the operation of the movie house to um, Italian immigrant Vincent Corta, uh, who named it the Deluxe Theater, put in a new pipe organ, and um, he would screen new films daily. Um, They're usually paired with shorter comedies or serials. So the Deluxe Theater operated through 1929, um, when competition from the new, larger, more modern Deer Path Theater forced it to close. Um, 
So you can see pictures of the, both the interior and exterior of the Deer Path Theater here, it's designed by Stanley Anderson and opened in 1928. Um, featured an oak paneled interior, balcony and mezzanine, 950 seats, state-of-the-art pipe organ. Um, by this uh, part of the, the latter part of the decade, the movie business was sort of transitioning from silent films to talkies, which included actors' dialogue and other sound effects. So money that um, Americans weren't spending on their weekly trips to the movies often went toward consumer goods like ready-to-wear clothes, home appliances, like electric refrigerators, and lots and lots of radios. Uh, the first commercial radio station hit the airwaves in 1920. And then three years later, there were more than 500 stations across the country. Um, by the end of the 1920s, there were radios in over 12 million households. So radios brought music, particularly jazz and blues, to a wider audience. Um, phonograph records, which sold over 100 million in 1927 alone, uh, carried tunes to listeners across the nation. So um, local shops like Wells and Coppethorne, Hardware, um, Wenban, uh, seized the opportunity to sell radios. And um, selling radios is actually how the longtime Lake Forest business Helanders got its start in 1922. Uh, while he was working as a chauffeur, Orville Helander installed a radio and antenna for his employer, Charles Schweppe. And soon people all over town were calling him to do the same thing for them. Um, so he ran with that business opportunity, opening the Lake Forest radio shop. You can see their ad in the center there um, on Western Avenue. Then um, it was during the Great Depression that Helander pivoted to printing um, when uh, he owed more to Zenith Radio than he was taking in, but received um, sort of um, very conveniently a printing press from a client as a trade for a radio. So uh, the most important consumer product of the 1920s was probably the automobile, however. Um, uh, low costs and generous credit made cars sort of affordable luxuries by the beginning of the decade, uh, but by the end they were practically necessities. Um, 1921, uh, the number of cars in the U.S. Uh, was just over 10 million, and then over the next 10 years ownership tripled. So in 1929, there was one car on the road for every five Americans. Uh, for women in particular, uh, cars provided more freedom and access to new destinations. So meanwhile, uh, an economy of automobiles was born. Businesses like service stations, garages, car dealerships, and motels sprang up to meet drivers' needs. So locally, we had Wenben Buick dealership, which seemed a natural outgrowth of their former livery service. Um, Deer Path Auto Sales sold Chevrolets. Um, Lake Forest Garage serviced cars and provided a place to house them. Uh, you could even fill up with air in Market Square at the Quality Tire Company, which was located on the site of Talbot's today. So the regulation of this new mode of transportation was largely left to local police departments. And so an epidemic of speeding and rash of auto thefts kept the Lake Forest Police on their toes, especially in the early 1920s. Um, in 1920, the department's own car was even stolen right from the city hall parking lot. Uh, Chicago area gangs were well aware that Lake Forest had a high level of automobile ownership, um, as well as garages that were often on, at a distance from homes on larger lots. Additionally, Lake Forest's winding curving streets, um, which as many of you know, have very few right angle corners on the east side of town, led to constant crashes um, before new stop signs were installed and trees and bushes trimmed back. Um, something that had not been necessary for the slower speed um, and lower frequency of carriage traffic. So in part, as a result of all this extra work, the Lakes Forest Police Force had to be increased from five people, as you see in 1920, to nearly 30 people 10 years later. Another reason for this expansion was prohibition, um, in effect by January of 1920 and the attendant rise in organized crime that the entire Chicago land region faced, um, to which some of those auto thefts were no doubt linked. 
So locally, several stills and distilleries were seized in Lake Forest during the early years of Prohibition. Um, for example, February 1920, uh, five Eastern Huron immigrants had been caught by Lake Forest police um, uh, making raisin whiskey and then selling it, which was the more potent crime. Um, local grocers even cited an unusually heavy demand for raisins at that time. So one whiskey still was located on Granby uh, and another on Illinois Road. So a Lake Forester article from February goes into detail about the raid um, and the whiskey, which was said to be about 90 proof. Uh, quote, when criticized by the federal officers for not having taken the gas stove on which the still was being boiled, Officer James Gordon remarked, what, take the woman's cook stove? You fellows are surely harder hearted than I am. So. He let the, <laughs> the, the family members keep the cook stove on which the, the whiskey was being made, which the federal officers apparently would not have done. Um, but in defense of the accused, the Lake Forester articles also mentions that um, the local Romanians say that in their country, almost every family is equipped to make its own whiskey and that the men did not realize that to do so in this country would be a crime, which was probably a little disingenuous, but. So um, even more serious than these sort of local stills was um, the so-called booze robberies um, in which um, many Lake Forest residences were broken into and their supplies of alcohol were stolen. Um, one theft was even connected with a fire that burned down one of Lake Forest's most iconic estates, Fairlawn. You can see the wreckage from that fire picture here. Um, in early 1920, nine men, many of them from um, local uh, longtime Lake Forest families, were charged with the theft of over $100,000 in booze. However, a jury in the county failed to convict them. Um, so it appears that uh, the community took care of the issue themselves. The paper noted that the defendants and their relatives in this instance made full restitution to the homeowners. So even beyond automobiles and prohibition, one um, final reason for that dramatic expansion of the local police department I mentioned had to do with the growth of the community in size as well as population. Um, 10 years after Market Square, uh, Lake Forest received sort of a dramatic facelift again, this time adding nine square miles to its boundaries. Um, so uh, Market Square had sort of kicked off an interest in town planning that soon spread to the city government of Lake Forest. And in 1923, the city passed a zoning ordinance to control development. It was one of the first in Illinois to do so. And uh, the plan commission was established in 1926. Um, its first task involved the acquisition of territory to the west of the city. Um, so at the time, uh, the city limits were generally everything east of Green Bay Road. Um, so the driving force for those who uh, owned property west of town involved sort of being connected to city utility and road services, as well as having planning control over the property in the future. You know, no factories next door, no high intense density uh, housing, etc. So in 1926, um, voters in the area approved the annexation um, by a vote of 303 to five. So Lake Forest tripled in land area. Um, we tend to think of the 1950s or 1980s maybe as the era of subdivisions, but this was also true for the 1920s, um, in particular in some of this new property just added to Lake Forest. So, um, Developer Henry K. Turnbull purchased properties along Deer Path, um, just east of Waukegan, and built Deer Path Hill Estates, which you can see pictured here. Um, an original selling point of Deer Path Hill Estates subdivision was its proximity to commuter railway. Uh, just down the road was the Deer Path station for the North Shore Line's um, brand new Skokie Valley route, which was built in 1923. Um, Although, as we mentioned, uh, automobile ownership was rising, um, the electric interurban was still a very popular way to get around. Um, so in addition to the Skokie Valley route, which ran right along today's Route 41, of course, Route 41 wasn't built until the 30s, um, there was the shoreline route of the North Shore interurban, which ran along the east side of the Union Pacific Railroad tracks, 
um, had several stops in town. And uh, the North Shore Line had several advantages over the regular commuter line because it went to a greater variety of destinations. It ran more often. It was ideal for shorter trips. Um, this electric railway was also the school bus for local students who attended school south of town um, at Deerfield Shield High School, which is you now Highland Park High School. Um, though the interurban automobile each offered their own advantages, the fastest commute to and from Chicago in the 20s was still on the Chicago and Northwestern. Um, the train that returned to Lake Forest in the five o'clock hour on weekdays had been informally referred to as the millionaire special for a number of years um, due to the large number of Lake Forest executives who wrote it. And in 1929, some of them got together and sort of formalized this arrangement by purchasing their own private coach. Um, so this club car was called the Deer Path and it was attached to an existing Chicago and Northwestern train, which um, went in from Lake Forest at 8 a.m. and came back from Chicago around five. So newspapers of the day described the interior as containing 54 comfortable chairs, all covered in plush blue fabric, um, two bridge tables, there was a private porter, um, dispensing service in a kitchen and buffet, uh, and he would stay with the car all day to receive packages for the riders of the car. Um, the reported fee for the privilege of membership in 1929 was 15000 plus the cost of a regular ticket. So on Saturdays, the club car was attached to the Gulf Special Train, which left Chicago at 12.20 p.m. Uh, the car featured a buffet lunch for members to eat as the car rolled north toward the fairways. So um, in the 20s, the country club really reigned supreme as the center of social life for many of those of means. And the golf course became an increasingly popular spot for outdoor recreation. Um, during the decade, the Chicago area witnessed a surge in golf course uh, construction. There were over 120 new courses, which was an average of one a month. Uh, the, um, a, a local golf periodical forecast in 1930 that at such a rate, Chicago would soon be the center of golf in the United States. But of course, construction tailed off in the 30s. Mm -hmm. However, uh, Lake Forest and Lake Bluff were not exempt from the trend. Um, three new courses opened in this period, uh, along with another that was planned but never launched. So the establishment of a public course in Lake Forest uh, reflected how golf was becoming popular for the general public, not just a select few. So there was uh, Deer Path and of course, Knollwood and Shore Acres also opened in this period. Uh, but for Deer Path, Several property owners west of Green Bay Road, uh, among them A.B. Dick, Noble Judah, and John Griffith, donated large tracts of land to the city to be used for recreational purposes. And by 1926, funds were appropriated and land was readied uh, to, um, for Alex Peary, who laid out the first nine holes of the course, uh, Deer Path Golf Course. And you can see a picture of its clubhouse, which was built later. Um, as well as some trees being moved around on the property. Uh, shops in town uh, um, closed early on Wednesday afternoons, um, you know, giving the service people sort of a, a half day off since they often worked on the weekends. And that also gave employees a chance to get in around the golf. We might have had yet another golf course if um, Samuel Insull, who was the Commonwealth Edison magnet, uh, had been successful in one of his endeavors. Uh, in 1928, Insull and a syndicate of 26 Chicago area businessmen purchased the former estate of J. Ogden Armour, Melody Farm. And they had plans to turn it into an aviation country club. So they had a vision of this executive fly-in golf club with a sort of a national membership of millionaires. Um, they uh, got started with construction, partially laying out the course and um, building a locker house, which was supposed to be attached to the main house with a pergola. But um, in one of sort of the first signs of a depression era economy in Lake Forest, by 1930, um, all construction had ceased and the property actually sat largely unused for um, about 15 more years. 
So all of these new clubs and courses followed in the footsteps of Lake Forest's first country club, uh, the Anwensia Club. And uh, in the 20s, the Anwensia Club was sort of the center of social life for many Lake Foresters and Chicagoans, especially during the summer. It's full of events and activities, including dinners, dances, horse shows, golf, tennis, and polo. Uh, by uh, the mid-1920s, though, the original clubhouse, which you can see pictured top left, uh, had been added on to many times and was actually beginning to come apart a bit at the seams. Uh, finally, the club had difficulty actually obtaining fire insurance for the building, which convinced them to replace it. Uh, they um, selected New York architect Harry T. Lindbergh for the job because he was not local and not a member, so no one was getting offended. Um, and so you can see his new French style clubhouse below, finished in 1928. Uh, much of the activity at Anwensia in this period centered on horses, horse shows, of course, can city continue to raise funds for local organizations like Alice Home Hospital and uh, the Lake Bluff Orphanage. Um, the Anwensia hunt, which um, had been dormant through much of the 1910s, resumed in 1921. Um, by 1930, though, the hunt uh, faced some difficulties holding events locally because of busier roads in the area and um, housing developments west of the club. So that's when the hunt club moved to Milburn in 1930. Mm -hmm. So of course, society uh, people would descend on Lake Forest for polo, golf, and other outdoor activities, uh, making the population of the city much higher in the summer than the winter. Um, the papers were filled with the names of people who stayed, um, who you know, for coming their comings and goings from town, whether they were um, opening up their own homes or staying with friends or family. Uh, for those without access to a country house or who might just be up for the weekend, uh, they needed a place to stay also. And so the new Deer Path Inn, uh, which you can see here on Illinois Road, opened in uh, July of 1929 to fill that role. So many of these summer or weekend visitors came up for polo. Uh, in the 1920s, Anwensia really had a national reputation for polo excellence. According to a 1920 article in Country Life in America, no other organization west of Meadowbrook, which was the famous polo club um, in Long Island, uh, can claim more right to renown as a polo capital than Anwensia. So the article goes on to say, um, every member of the club does his bit to keep the interest in the sport at par a man who never play the game themselves cheerfully contribute to a jackpot to buy and train ponies, which younger members who may not be so well supplied with pocket money may ride for the glory of Anwensia's colors. And of course, polo being one of the sort of most expensive sports to maintain since you needed a large stable of horses um, uh, to, to play. One person who really helped put Anwensia on the world's polo map in the early 1900s was uh, Frederick McLaughlin, you can see here. He was the heir to the McLaughlin's Manor House coffee firm and one of the top polo players in the Midwest, playing both nationally and internationally. Then um, by the 1920s, he was also known for putting Chicago on the map in another sport, um, that was hockey. In 1926, he purchased an expansion franchise for Chicago in the National Hockey League. Uh, which he named the Blackhawks in honor of his old division from World War I. Um, during uh, McLaughlin's 18 years as owner, the Blackhawks won two Stanley Cups, 34 and 38, and he was said to be a very hands-on owner, sort of going through coaches and tinkering with the roster at a prodigious rate. So McLaughlin um, possessed his own notoriety, of course, in several fields, but his fame was actually dwarfed by that of his wife. Uh, in 1923, he'd married the renowned dancer, actress, and fashion icon Irene Castle, who was 16 years younger. Um, they uh, lived on Old Mill Road in Lake Forest. Um, so, so by the 1920s, uh, was largely retired from acting and dancing. Uh, she had sort of a new interest at the time, 
which was animals. Um, 1928, she and her friend Ellen Swift founded Orphans of the Storm, an animal shelter and pet adoption center, which was uh, initially located in Deerfield. Um, in her dancing days, she was known for touring the world with her pets in tow. And going forward, she um, did a lot um, of, you know, talks around the country and around the Chicago area for uh, school children as well as others about um, animal welfare. But Irene Castle had been a household name um, long before she moved to Lake Forest. Um, she and her first husband, Vernon Castle, were famous ballroom dancers, uh, lighting up Broadway and appearing in several silent movies. Uh, together, they revolutionized the world of dancing. They popularized the fox trot and tango, as well as dances to ragtime and jazz rhythms. So Vernon Castle, um, who is a British sus uh, subject, got his pilot license in 1915, which was uh, to help him get a role to fight in World War I for the Royal Flying Corps. And he was uh, sadly killed in a training accident in 1918, leaving Irene a widow at the age of 25. Uh, she had a short-lived second marriage before um, Frederick McLaughlin to Robert Tremont, which ended in divorce in 1923. And Tremont reportedly lost all her money um, from her uh, movie and dance career in a failed stock market investment. Um, but uh, Irene Castle earlier um, in the 19 teens, again, uh, without intending to make a fashion statement, she's credited with being the first woman to sort of notoriously bob her hair. Uh, in 1914, as the story goes, she had to have her appendix out and um, decided to cut her short because it would be easier to take care of for the hospital stay. And before it had grown back, a friend convinced her to go out in public for dinner. Uh, so she put a necklace across her forehead to keep her hair in place. And her picture was taken. Uh, she was so popular at the time that apparently women across the country began to mimic her bob hairstyle held in place by what became known as a castle band. Um, so um, she, you know, also as a, as a dancer, um, revolutionized in part the world of fashion by doing things like discarding the whalebone corset in favor of looser elastic fitting ones and um, embracing the vogue for shorter skirts. Um, so her popularity um, helped um, sort of give the impression of her as the original flapper for embracing these trends. So the flapper, of course, is probably one of the most familiar symbols of the Roaring Twenties. Um, young women with bobbed hair, and short skirts who um, purportedly drank, smoked, um, said what might be termed unladylike things at the time. Um, in reality, most young women in the 1920s were um, not completely like this, although certainly many did adopt a fashionable flapper wardrobe. And Lake Forest women were not at all immune to these trends. Um, you can see the bob hairstyle, which became ubiquitous midway through the decade on four uh, different uh, young Lake Foresters here in this picture. Uh, because the bob and um, the attendant waves required more frequent styling than longer hair, beauty shops like uh, Marinello, which was in uh, Market Square, uh, sort of proliferated during this period. Uh, in 1917, the telephone directory for Lake Forest listed a few barbers, but no women's hairdressers, but by 1930, there were at least five. Uh, so whether or not uh, these young women identified as flappers, um, they certainly were embracing uh, an unprecedented degree of independence. Um, higher education and employment among 20-something women were at record levels, although, of course, nowhere near approaching the levels today. Um, but these women were spending more time than ever sort of among their own age cohort in a longer period than before as well. Uh, for those with access to cars, the newfound mobility revolutionized their free time as well. So many social norms, uh, like uh, females requiring chaperones and restricting private time for women and men began to relax. Um, although not so much that women traveling unchaperoned were not remarked upon. Um, so one case in point are these four young Lake Forest women um, 
20-year-old Lake Forest residents, Gladys Spellman, Irene Adridge, Esther Conway, and Reed Harrington, uh, took a journey in 1920 that caused really quite a stir. All four of them were graduates of Deerfield Shields High School. They all had jobs at local firms and retailers. Um, Spellman was a stenographer at the John Griffith Real Estate Office. Irene Adridge was a billing machine operator. Um, Conway, a postal clerk, and um, Gladys um, Her and Reed Harrington, a milner. So uh, these four young women made a pact to work their way across America. So they took an extended unchaperoned trip, um, which California is the ultimate destination. Uh, and it was unusual enough to attract attention from both local and Chicago newspapers. Uh, they left in October to a farewell reception and dance and stopped successively for several weeks, weeks in Omaha, in Denver, and in Salt Lake City, where they found work to earn money for the next leg of the trip. Um, some of the jobs that they found were apparently more lucrative at other, than others. Um, on the leg from Las Vegas to Los Angeles, they were obliged to ride in a baggage car um, for about 360 miles. So they spent the winter working in Los Angeles and returned uh, to Lake Forest in April after a grand adventure. Um, but uh, cross-country travel was still far from the norm. However, locally, uh, the young people were making use of newfound freedom and mobility as well. And education and well, institutions like, like Forest College were sort of struggling to keep up with these changing norms. Uh, in 1924, the college issued a new rule that uh, during parties, women students are not permitted to be in automobiles outside the building, nor to go off campus except by permission. Um, in 1920, the college's acting president was forced to issue sort of a prior uh, un unimagined edict, which, uh, quote, forbid harmony after 11 p.m., because <clears throat> apparently at two o'clock on a Saturday morning, um, according to newspaper reports, uh, quote, a jazz piano was loaded on a wagon, the snappiest banjo and trap drum artists were engaged, and the notes that emanated shared their blueness with the night. <laughs> part of Lake Forest shimmied and the other part swore, but nobody slept. So what these young people wanted to do was dance. They were dancing the Charleston, the Cakewalk, many other uh, uh, new dances of the time. Jazz play bands played everywhere. They played, apparently, on campus at 2 a.m. at dance halls like the Aragon in Chicago, were heard on radio stations, on records. Um, of course, some older people objected strongly to jazz music and the moral disasters it supposedly inspired. Um, but many young people loved the freedom they felt in the music and on the dance floor. So one local young person who was influenced by this was Bix Beiderbeck. Uh, he was born Leon Bismarck Beiderbeck in, uh, in Iowa in 1903. Uh, he could play several instruments very well, but it was the cornet um, on which he excelled. And his parents sent him to Lake Forest Academy in 1921 actually hoping that this would curb his musical endeavors and sort of set him straight and encourage academic focus. Um, but this was not to be the case at all. Uh, Beiderbeck joined the school band um, and then with a, a classmate, he organized a music for hire group called the Cy Bix Orchestra, which played at several school dances. Um, you can see Bix Beiderbeck pictured here actually as a member of the baseball team, um, circled in red. Uh, also pictured at top left with his coach, um, who is the, also the future Chicago Bears coach, Ralph Jones, um, who coached at LFA at that time. Uh, however, back to, to Biterbeck, uh, Lake Forest actually brought Vic Spiderbeck closer to the thriving jazz community in Chicago. He would constantly sneak out of school to visit the speakeasies and jazz clubs. Um, his adventures often lasted overnight, and this regard for, disregard rather, for curfew and illegal drinking got him expelled from Lake Forest Academy. So after leaving Lake Forest, he played in several bands across the Midwest and New York, uh, including Paul Whiteman and his orchestra, which was one of the most popular dance bands in the U.S. at the time. So he really became one of the most sought after cornet players of the era. Um, he was known for his very innovative style and 
is considered one of the great early jazz mu musicians, along with Jer Louis Armstrong, um, but is much less known because he sadly passed away at only age 28 after struggling with alcoholism. Uh, so later in the 1920s, Lake Forest Academy's sister school, Ferry Hall, had its own brush with future celebrity. So here pictured you can see Harleen Carpenter, later known as Jean Harlow, and uh, she moved to the Highland Park from Kansas City, Missouri, and um, enrolled at Ferry Hall in 1926. Um, when she appeared in the school's production of A Winter's Tale, which you can see pictured here. So uh, Harley and Carpenter's time at Ferry Hall was apparently filled with drama uh, beyond theater productions. She initially refused to, ref to wear the required Oxford saddle shoes, um, uh, sort of uh, something that was detailed in the correspondence between her uh, headmistress, Ms. Tremaine at Ferry Hall, and her personal uh, physician, Dr. James Montgomery. Uh, Carpenter had apparently told her um, headmistress that the doctor had forbidden her to wear the Oxford shoes, um, a statement that Ms. Tremaine met with some skepticism. And so she wrote a letter to the doctor asking about it. He wrote back, quote, about Miss Carpenter's shoes. She has been used to high heels for a long time, much longer than I think is sensible for a girl her age, which is 15. It is my opinion that you know perfectly how to handle Miss Carpenter. Um, that may have worked for a short time, but um, by 1927, uh, Harleyan had eloped and actually was living in Hollywood making films. Uh, so after Howard Hughes cast her in Hell's Angels in 1930, her career took off and she changed her name to Jean Harlow. Um, in addition to celebrity students, Lake Forest also had its fair share of celebrity visitors in the 1920s. So in October 1924, the Prince of Wales, later Edward VIII, arrived in Lake Forest by a special train. You see the, uh, that picture from newspaper articles here. He was greeted at the station by over a thousand local residents. At the time, he was the guest of Lewis F. Swift and had come on the trip to show the appreciation of the British government for the enormous quantities of meat products sent to the UK uh, throughout the war by um, Chicago stockyards. So he received a brief tour of Lake Forest and also was uh, serenaded with uh, Prince of Wales, We Are True to You by the students of Ferry Hall. Um, he had breakfast at the Swift Estate on Green Bay Road and then returned to Chicago to tour the stockyards. Um, around this time, his future wife, Wallace Warfield Spencer, later Wallace Simpson, uh, who at the time was the wife of Naval Officer Earl Winfield Spencer Jr., was reportedly renting a house in Lake Forest on Oakwood Avenue for a short time in the early 1920s. Uh, she and the prince did not meet on this occasion. He was only in Lake Forest for a couple of hours uh, and would, wouldn't meet for a few more years. But um, of course, in 1936, Edward VIII abdicated the throne to marry her. And they became the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Another brush with royalty came in 1926 when the crown prince Gustavus Adolphus and Princess Louise of Sweden visited Lake Forest in June. Um, the princess, who was the former Louise Mountbatten, was the great granddaughter of Queen Victoria. So this royal party traveled up to Chicago from Great Lakes Naval Station, um, or up, yeah, Chicago to Great Lakes Naval Station by motor yacht, and then they drove down to Lake Forest. So um, let's see, so this royal itinerary include the prince playing golf at Old Elm Club, and then was hosted by uh, Charles Morishad Schweppe, um, who gave an elaborate dinner party in uh, their honor at, um, at their house Mayflower Place. So you can see a picture um, taken by one of the staff um, at uh, the Schweppe estate of this event. Uh, the gate of the estate was apparently decorated with American and Swedish flags with uh, yellow roses and larkspur to sort of carry out the color scheme. Uh, thousands of electric light bulbs illuminated the grounds. They had an opera performance and 
a pavilion um, with three different orchestras playing um, uh, to, to lead the dancing. So Gustavus Adolphus later ascended to the Swedish throne as King Gustav VI in 1950 upon the death of his father. Um, at the time, he was the world's uh, oldest heir apparent to the monarchy, um, which record was, of course, broken by Charles, Prince of Wales a few years ago. So the Lake Forest visit that probably had the most significant repercussions for the 1920s culture uh, did not take place in the 1920s at all, but in 1915 and 1916, when future author F. Scott Fitzgerald came to town. Uh, so Fitzgerald was then a student at Princeton, and he came to Lake Forest ostensibly to see an aunt of his. Uh, of course, also a number of his Princeton classmates were, all, were Lake Foresters, Douglases and Ordways, uh, but really he came to see Ginevra King. So you can see uh, Ginevra King pictured here on the cover of Town and Country Magazine in 1918. Uh, she was born in 1898, a daughter of the financier Charles Garfield King. And she grew up spending summers at her family's Ridge Road estate. Uh, she really was a leader of the younger social set with her friends um, who were known as the Big Four, uh, Courtney Letts, Peg Carey, and Edith Cummings. And in January of 1915, uh, the 18-year-old F. Scott Fitzgerald had met the then 16-year-old Ginevra King at a dance in his hometown of St. Mahal, Minnesota. Um, Ginevra was there visiting with her roommate from the Westover Girls School in Connecticut. And Ginevra was one of the most sort of uh, desired debutantes in Lake Forest at the time. After their first meeting, meeting um, she and Fitzgerald began to exchange letters. Uh, some of his were apparently 30 pages in length and had to be mailed in two envelopes. So I can imagine that the teenage Ginevra found it a bit overwhelming to keep up her end of the correspondence. But Fitzgerald related how he immediately fell in love with Ginevra King. She was beautiful, rich, socially secure, um, his dream of the perfect girl. So here you can see the King summer home on Ridge Road, uh, designed by Howard Van Doren Shaw. Uh, and this house uh, figured in several of Fitzgerald's writings. Um, it was, quote, more mysterious and gay than other houses, Fitzgerald wrote of the villa in his short story, Winter Dreams, um, which was a precursor to Gatsby. Um, he wrote, there was a feeling of mystery in it, of bedrooms upstairs more beautiful and strange than other bedrooms, of gay and radiant activities taking place through these deep corridors, and of romances that were not musty and all, laid already in lavender, but were fresh and breathing, and set forth in rich motor cars and in great dances whose flowers were scarcely withered. So the rich motor cars referenced in this quote were actually a particular sore point with Fitzgerald. Uh, he, on one of his visits, had apparently been outgunned by another of Ginevra's um, beau, uh, Deering Davis, who had offered to take her home from a party in his electric. Uh, Fitzgerald, of course, had no car. And later, insult was added to injury when a member of the Big Four, Courtney Letts, commented that Davis was as poor as a church mouse. So <laughs> Fitzgerald, I, I suppose, wondered what sort of unfortunate rodent that made him. Um, he wrote a bit about his Lake Forest visit and his ledger, which you can see excerpted here a little bit, uh, which was a brief sort of at times very cryptic diary that he kept. Uh, and this is the end of the entry for August 1916. Um, so the highlighted portion reads, quote, poor boys shouldn't think of marrying rich girls. So some scholars believe that this was something said or at least insinuated by Ginevra's father or by another authoritative Lake Forest figure and sort of meant for Fitzgerald to overhear. Um, the final break in his relationship with Ginevra came um, less than two years later, though they kept up their correspondence in the meantime. And afterward, Ginevra stated that they really only spent like a total of 15 hours together, all of it pretty well chaperoned. But um, in 1918, is, that's when uh, Fitzgerald met his future wife, Zelda, pic pictured together um, at the right there. 
And that was right about the time that Ginevra announced her engagement to William Hamilton Mitchell Jr. Uh, their pictures below on the left, who was considered one of the sort of catches of Chicago at the time and who she had known for many years. Uh, so later that year, um, the two of them were married uh, as uh, Mitchell was a World War I Navy pilot and they had a, a wartime wedding. So according to one of his biographers, uh, Fitzgerald didn't get over it easily using uh, not only King's character, but the deep longing for a love lost to fuel much of his writing. So scholars believe that many of his female characters are based on Ginevra, most notably, of course, Daisy Buchanan in The Great Gatsby, which was published in 1925, but also characters in This Side of Paradise and countless short stories. Fitzgerald said once, uh, the whole idea of Gatsby is the unfairness of a poor young man not being able to marry a girl with money. This theme comes up again and again because I lived it. So Fitzgerald also said that Winter Dreams Judy Jones, who was pretty typical, the heroines he based on Ginevra, was patterned after, quote, my first girl at ages 18 to 20, whom I've used over and over and never forgotten. So um, the connection between uh, The Great Gatsby and Lake Forest does not end with Ginevra King. Um, the character of Jordan Baker, the female golfer who's Daisy's best friend, is based on Lake Forest's Edith Cummings, who is a close friend of Ginevra and another of the big four. So in the novel, Fitzgerald wrote of Edith that, uh, quote, there was a jauntiness about her movements as if she had first learned to walk upon golf courses on clean, crisp mornings. Um, and, you know, this was certainly the case for Edith Cummings, who grew up um, in a Lake Forest atmosphere of golf. Her father and her brother were both talented golfers, although she was the best known of any of them, probably. Um, like Jordan Baker, she was talented and known for um, her golfing exploits. She won the U.S. Women's Amateur Championship in 1923. Uh, reporters called her the fairway flapper. Um, However, unlike Jordan Baker, she was known to be an honorable player. She had no similar accusations of cheating um, or unfair play following her career. Uh, Cummings was even the first woman athlete and indeed the first golfer um, to be featured on the cover of Time Magazine, 1924, which you can see here. So uh, Fitzgerald was sort of nearly as spellbound by Lake Forest as he was by Ginevra. Uh, to him, the two possessed really the same allure of wealth, polished desirability and achievement while remaining remote and ultimately unattainable. Um, he references Lake Forest several times directly in his writings, uh, including a sh his short story, A Nice Quiet Place. Uh, he writes, um, out to Lake Forest, where her friends moved already in an aura of new boys, new tunes, parties, and house parties yet to be. Lake Forest, with its thousand enchanted verandas, the dancing on the outdoor platform of the club, and always the boys, centaurs, in new cars. So, still a bit bitter. Um, but he was um, so permanently entranced with the community's allure that uh, 25 years after his first visit, he wrote to his daughter, Scotty, once I thought that Lake Forest was the most glamorous place in the world. Maybe it was. So um, that concludes my portion of the presentation, but I am as always happy to take any questions or observations. Um, and um, we'll also do so by email too, if you prefer. Thanks, Lori. Sure. So at this point, if anybody wants to either uh, type a question into the chat bar to Lori, uh, that would be fine. Or if you just want to unmute yourselves and ask a question, uh, feel free to, to do so. I'll ask because um, I was curious. We have so many really fascinating people that pop in in the 20s. Do you think that there is um, it's just a personal question? Is there like a, a celebrity kind of figure that you think sort of touched Lake Forest in the 20s that is your favorite or you think was the most sort of influential in garnering attention for the area? Oh, that's interesting. Um, 
I mean, you know, I think um, Irene Castle's fame can't really be overestimated. And she really sort of did a lot at, in that period for uh, to bring attention to local causes, um, especially the animal welfare movement, which she was sort of constantly associated with in all the newspapers. Um, so, um, you know, from from the people that I discussed in this talk, she would probably be one of them. But there were certainly, you know, many others who um, what, who weren't mentioned. So, <laughs> lots more to learn about the 1920s. I hope that some of you follow us on uh, social media because th we're we're continuing to do a series where we um, uh, called 100 Years Ago Today, where we talk about what was going on. Um, in the community exactly 100 years ago based on newspaper reports and things like that, which has been um, a lot of fun over the past year and I've learned a lot from it. So um, we plan to continue that going into the next year. Um, but um, yeah, definitely a nice way to immerse yourself into the community of the past. Cool. So we have a couple of questions popping up on the chat. Um, were any of the Lake Foresters, um, this is from Liz Sharp, were they starstruck by the visiting dignitaries and celebrities that stopped by? <laughs> um, I think very likely, I, you know, the, especially the two, the two royal visitors received like quite a lot of attention. You know, there were like full page spreads in the Tribune of basically like every single place that the Prince of Wales <laughs> visited um, during during his um, his very brief time in, in town. So, um, you know, I think that Lake Forest residents were proud to have, you know, hosted them both briefly as well. That makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see. Uh, Jack Hanslevic wants to ask, uh, apart from Romanians and raisins, were there any other moonshiners of note in the area? Um, I mean, I think Lake Bluff has its own, um, own story about that, which, um, which they tell very well up at the Lake Bluff History Museum. Um, is, and um, certainly, you know, in surrounding communities, there were many as well. I'm still hoping to continue to learn, uh, to learn more about that. So in Lake Forest specifically, I don't know, you know, I think Lake Forest was more known in the period for the break-ins because, you know, so many people had sort of well-known supplies of liquor laid away. Um, that, um, you know, throughout the 20s, like early on especially, but even later when you would think that they had gone through their stash, there were still uh, still targeted by, you know, whether it was individuals or, um, you know, rings of um, organized crime. Um, so that's what Lake Forest was known for more than anything else, I think. That's really interesting too. Um, Let's see, Maureen Costello wants to ask, during that period, was uh, Lake Forest still largely a summer retreat or are there also insights into the winter season in the area? Well, um, I think, you know, this was sort of the heyday of it as a summer retreat and um, going into the 1930s, lifestyle started to change necessarily, of course, because of the economic situation. Um, so probably this would be maybe the period when the population difference between the 19, the summer and the winter was the most stark. Um, and uh, then, you know, people sort of stop, started to stop living that way with multiple residences, um, you know, lots of cutting back on travel in the 1930s and then later during the war because of rationing. Um, and that led to the sort of a, a different um, community by the 1950s when estates were starting to be subdivided and, and things like that. Um, one more question from, um, from, from Jack Henslevic. He is curious uh, to learn more about the armors and their counterparts considering the uh, number, the size of their estate and the number of their properties in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. Um, as well as tying uh, Lake Forest and Highwoods development, considering the uh, servants and, and labor that were brought into the area. Um, yeah, I mean, there were, I think, three or four different armor families who lived in the community. Um, 
and as I think I very briefly mentioned in the in the um, talk, it was like in the early 1920s, the uh, uh, the Armour Meatpacking Company, you know, faced a really dire financial situation as you know, sort of overproduction from the war caught up with them, and um, the family's finances were very tied up in um, Armour stock, and so. Uh, you know, the entire family, but led by J. Ogden Armour, really had to cut back. You know, I think there was a point at which J. Ogden Armour lost, who was like the second richest American at the time, lost like a million dollars a day for almost 100 days in a row. Um, so, you know, that, that was why Melody Farm had to be sold. And, you know, he was never quite the same after that. Um, and J. Ogden Armour, I think, had never really actually wanted, he was a second son who wasn't expecting to inherit the, the company. Um, his older brother passed away young. So um, it wasn't really his passion in the first place. And so he, you know, he died in the late 1920s. Um, and then I think it was in the early 30s that it was discovered that his widow, Lolita Sheldon Armour, who had sort of slightly retrenched to a beautiful, you know, house on Green Bay Road, later uh, later after that but it was discovered that one of her um uh stock um stocks that had sort of been overlooked by the bankruptcy lawyers it was not thought to be worth anything was worth it was in you know an oil stock worth millions and the family was able to become more influential again in the company in the early 30s and that's when she built her green bay road house and such so um so yeah, so there, there are sort of boom and bust story is really interesting because it's like the opposite of everyone else in the 20s, right? Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. That's so interesting. Um, any other questions from anyone? You can unmute yourselves or put them in the chat. If not, then um, I will say thank you again uh, to our speaker and to everyone for tuning in. And if you want to learn more about uh, about the 20s and about like forest in general, of course, you can find a lot of the stories about these individuals on our website. Um, so you can head over to lflbhistory.org and uh, find out a lot more about some of these very, very cool players from, from the decade. So thank you again. Yep, thanks, everyone. Lori. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Well, that was good. I get out of here. I just hit leave. Good.